Good morning from Austin, Texas. Uh, this is Dick Longquist, and I am chairman and president of Longquist Sequestration and its uh, affiliated Longquist companies. Uh, glad to be speaking today at the Carbon Expo 2022. Uh, I'm going to be speaking today about project considerations for EPA Class 6 CO2 sequestration and EPA Class 2 uh, with MRV, monitor, uh, record, and verify. Those are the two ways in which you can qualify for tax credits under 45Q uh, within the IRS code. All right, we're gonna talk about project considerations. What you need to take into consideration uh, while you're navigating a class six or a class two with MRV uh, application that would qualify you for tax credits under 45Q. Uh, today's outline, we're going to talk about CO2 sequestration and lawn questing company and how we're helping clients uh, navigate uh, the class six world. Uh, we're also going to talk about proximity to CO2 sources. We'll then talk about uh, geologic considerations, uh, then pore space rights, and then the regulatory pathways of how do you na navigate class six and class two with MRV. So Longquist and Company is a very diversified consulting firm, uh, but about 70% of our book of business is uh, helping our clients inject stuff into the earth. Uh, we've been doing this a couple of decades. We do um, all kinds of injection wells from class one through class six. Uh, that would include brine disposal within the oil and gas business, uh, class one hazardous waste, acid gas injection wells, gas storage, salt caverns, liquid storage. So anything that would involve uh, any of the EPA classes one through six, uh, we have a long history of helping our clients uh, navigate that space. So Longquist and Company has eight offices throughout North America. We have six offices uh, in the United States, two offices in Canada, and we have a few uh, remote employees that are scattered around uh, the U.S. and Canada and some other places. So just a little bit about Longquist and Company. I, I had mentioned that about 70% of our book of business is uh, injection. Uh, currently, we have about 22 active CO2 sequestration clients. We have quite a few more that are in the pipeline, but these would be clients and projects that we are underway. Um, we're working towards a class six or a class two uh, within MRV. Wide breadth, uh, I do get asked a lot about you know, who we're working for. And uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, uh, spread of clients, uh, major oil companies, long haul pipelines, gas and liquid pipelines, chemical companies, refiners, uh, private equity backed companies that don't have anything to do with injection. So we have the gamut from major oil companies uh, to LNG companies and companies that just want the tax credit. So they would be, we had a client come in, uh, they have a billion dollars of private equity money and they know nothing about wells. They know nothing about CO2. They were strictly set up to generate uh, the tax credit. So at, at Longquist, what we can do to help you, we can either be a one-stop shop or we can be a la carte. So, you know, if, you know, example would be one of our major oil company clients that, you know, already has buildings and buildings and buildings full of, drilling engineers and geologists and geophysicists. Uh, that might be a more of an a la carte assignment for us. Uh, other clients need help with everything. So from the permitting to site selection, 
to actually drilling the well and getting the well drilled, getting the permit uh, finalized uh, and handing them the keys when we're done. Um, so we've been involved in injection for a long, long time, uh, class one through five. Like I said uh, before, um, we uh, currently have about 75 CO2 sequestration projects we're working on. Uh, I had mentioned that uh, uh, one of my partners, C uh, Steve T, is going to be doing another presentation today where he's going to talk about everything that I haven't covered. But Steve, for the last two years, we've been assisting a client uh, with uh, CO2 sequestration in Louisiana. And Steve sits on the ad hoc committee for sequestration in Louisiana. And our firm helped write the Louisiana code. And uh, one of our partners, Rob Cruz, his brother, Raymond, is a state legislator in uh, Louisiana and helped sponsor the Louisiana sequestration bill that got passed. Um, I think we might want to talk a little bit about uh, the sequestration environment. I know uh, legislatively and legally, uh, I know Steve Petit is going to talk about uh, the greater framework, but one thing to keep in mind is this is very, very new, and we think both at a state and federal level that we are going to uh, be needing some legislative amendments. Uh, you know, both at the state level and at the EPA level, I think everybody has woken up since we started down the process of filing permits and said, uh-oh, we forgot about that. And so there's gonna be some cleanup legislation uh, that happens um, uh, very quickly here, uh, both at the state and federal level. Uh, so this is a kind of a list of what we have going on. So we have both pure class six permits. We're uh, currently preparing. Uh, we have about 20 greenfield site selections we're working on, and we have about five class two with MRV. Currently have uh, one Louisiana permit that's uh, been filed with EPA Region 6 uh, that has been handed off to the L LADNR in Louisiana for uh, technical review. Um, these are where Longquist and Company is currently active in the US and Canada. Uh, we'll talk about geologic site selections, but this map will help you understand where the vast majority of our clients are undertaking class six projects. And so, you know, right now I would say 80% of our projects that we're looking at are from Brownsville, Texas, over to Mobile Bay, Louisiana, uh, and inland from there. We are looking around the country uh, and in Canada. Uh, the map's a little stale as of this morning. Uh, we, we have a project in Nova Scotia, uh, Canada that we're working on. So proximity to the CO2 source. So you need, a, you need a supply of CO2 to inject into the earth. And so the typical uh, sources of CO2 or what we call smokestack sources. Um, this is an emissions uh, map uh, with EPA data on CO2 emissions by state. Uh, there's also other technology that's out there. We call it direct air capture. Uh, we have a couple of clients that are looking at that. Um, it's, uh, I'd say 95% of what we're doing is traditional smokestack capture projects. Uh, we do have clients that are looking at uh, direct air capture. You know, there's some ad definite advantages to direct air capture, you can put your black box anywhere and start taking CO2 uh, out, of, out of the air. Um, so it gives you some advantages on placement of your project. Uh, it's newer technology. There's a bunch of different technologies, but there's some really smart guys, Bill Gates, Elon Musk, 
Rhett Bennett and Black Mountain. So there's some there's some smart players playing the direct air capture game. Uh, the typical uh, sources for uh, CO2 emissions in this country and around the world would be power generation plants, hydrocarbon processing plants, uh, refineries, gas plants, uh, things like that. Chemical plants, cement plants are a big emitter. Uh, there's a lot of CO2 that comes out of industrial and food processing, ethanol plants, uh, LNG plants. These have been early big movers within the class six world. Uh, the, the Europeans are very much interested in uh, getting green and or carbon neutral uh, LNG delivered to Europe and they're willing to pay for it. Uh, large factories um, and then direct air capture like we just talked about. So all CO2 emissions are not created equal. Um, this is a graph of dollars per ton on the y-axis and on the x-axis types of emission points. And this is relative cost to grab the CO2 out of the atmosphere. So one thing to emphasize today, Longquist and Company is the downhole partner uh, for our clients. Uh, we are not the capture guy. So the technology that goes over to the smokestack and grab, grabs it, uh, they would typically then hand it off to us and that's where we pick it up, injecting it uh, into the earth. But this is a very wide breadth of a cost to actually capture uh, the CO2. And this kind of fits in, if you look at this graph with natural gas processing, these were some of the very first movers um, that we saw coming and knocking on our door. So geologic consideration. Uh, we have about uh, 10 geologists, geophysicists, petrophysicists on our staff right now. And once class six came around, all these guys came out of the oil and gas business. These are all exploration guys. And so it took a while to retrain all our geologists to think like, and I remember one of them was like, look, I need you to go off and find the perfect dry hole. Yeah, he looked at me like I was crazy. Uh, but in some respects, what we're looking for from a, a, from a geology perspective is exactly that. Um, we'll, we'll talk about some considerations within that world, but I think you'll see uh, later on in our presentation, but about 80% of what we're working on is along the Gulf Coast, and it's not by accident. Uh, the reason everybody's starting there is one, there's a lot of smokestacks along the Gulf Coast, so there's plenty of CO2. And two, there's very good rock along the Gulf Coast. I'd say 80% of the projects we're working on are looking at big, thick, uh, stacked pays, typically within the Miocene uh, formation. So a typical injection zone, things you need to think about is good porosity, good permeability, and how thick your injection interval is. Uh, the EPA is going to also, as part of your class six permit, you're gonna to have to prove to them uh, your confining layers, both uh, your cap rock on the top and your confining, lower confining layer on the bottom uh, and the regional extent of these confining layers. So the Gulf Coast is a great place to start. I keep bringing that up and that, because that's where we're seeing a lot of activity. We're seeing it around, the country, but you know, along the Gulf Coast, we have big, thick shales uh, that make great confining layers, both on the top and the bottom of the Miocene. So, threw up some uh, uh, ancient geology maps, and uh, for all y'all that are geotypes, uh, you know, we can kind of skip over this, but it, it's a little hard to see 
today. Glad to give everybody a copy of the PowerPoint. But this has annotated in all the boundaries of the states today. Uh, this is a, a good example of where the ancient oceans were. What we're looking for typically is very good sedimentary rocks. And a lot of our projects that we're working on today match up with the light blue uh, area on this map. So this is the, what the world looked like in the late Cretaceous times. Uh, and so you can see uh, Gulf Coast, mid-continent, all the way up into Canada. This is areas that are going to have uh, good porosity, good permeability, typically. All right, so the EPA also wants uh, your CO2 uh, sequestration projects to be in a geologically stable environment. Uh, so this is a map from the USGS, a uh, typical earthquake map. Um, we're currently telling our clients to stay in the white, the blue, and the green. Um, I'm not telling you you can't do projects in the other areas. I'm just telling you that, you know, you're going to have to get the EPA comfortable if you're in an earthquake zone. You know, we have clients that are California-based companies, and politically, they really want to do CO2 sequestration in their backyard. You know, we're not telling them no, uh, but we're just saying that it's going to be geologically uh, challenging. Um, a great example is, is in California, 90% of the oil fields in California were found with surface seeps of oil all the way to the surface, meaning leaky faults. So we, we want to stay out of uh, areas that are, you know, going to set off uh, alarms at the EPA uh, for geostability and uh, leaky faults. Pore space. So class six is a very interesting uh, permit class. It's very different than class one through class five. Um, within the class six world, you need to own all the pore space. And we're gonna talk, we have some more slides on that, but uh, uh, the pore space you need to, uh, you need to, uh, um, own or control, so that the EPA doesn't care if you own it, if you lease it, or some other mechanism of control, but you need, wherever the CO2 plume is gonna go, you have to have those rights. Um, I always throw this uh, graph up. Uh, we have um, about 80% of our clients came from the oil business. You know, it's, it's injection in the earth, it's wells. So it makes sense that a lot of our clients are oil guys. Um, and they always ask because they they mentally can't get their hands around tons per year. So we've, we've kind of built a cheat sheet here that you can convert MCF a day or barrels a day uh, back to understand roughly what that's equivalent on the, uh, on the, tons of CO2 per year slide. All right, so let's talk about geology and uh, the plume. So when we're talking about the plume, the plume is the actual uh, CO2 area within your injection horizon. So any of any area where CO2 is occupying the pore space, we're, we're calling the plume. Uh, things we're looking for uh, with good site selection uh, within the uh, geologic world for CO2 sequestration is good porosity, good permeability, uh, 
proximity of faults in the area. We don't want to be injecting up next to a, a known fault because uh, injection can actually cause induced seismicity. Um, and within your plume area, you're going to have to manage all artificial penetrations. And when I use that word, the simple word for that is wells. So if I end up with a plume of five square miles that my CO2 is gonna cover from my injection well, um, if there's 20 wells, old wells, so these would be old oil and gas wells within my plume, the EPA is gonna make me account for those wells. And when I say account for them, I'm not saying go down to the Texas Railroad Commission or the LADNR and make sure they've been plugged. You're gonna to have to plug them to storage standards, not plugging standards. So there's a good chance if you have well bores within your plume, you're gonna to have to re-enter those well bores and plug them to a higher standard. Is that 400,000? Is that $600,000 a well? It's a real consideration along the Gulf Coast of artificial penetrations. So this slide right here, this would be some typical inputs um, on the modeling side. I think Steve Petit is gonna get into this a little bit more, but there's five pieces of software that the EPA is gonna let you use to do your modeling. Uh, one of them is Eclipse, which is a Schlumberger product. Another one is called GEMS, which is Computer Modeling Group out of Canada. And then there's three other pieces of software uh, that have been promulgated mostly with legacy history on class one hazardous waste disposal. And those were all promulgated by three of the United States National Laboratories, Sandia National Laboratories, Idaho National Laboratories, and I believe Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. This screenshot here is um, uh, a typical uh, gridded cell grid um, looking straight down. So this is a structure map, which are all the black lines and overlaid um, are cells for a 3D model. This one happens to be uh, in the GEMS CMG model. And um, uh, this shows a typical modeling output. Um, one of the takeaways from gems uh, uh, or Eclipse or any of these is gonna be, what is the shape of my plume? And you can see this one has a little bit of an odd shape. It's not a perfect cylinder. Uh, this is looking down onto the plume. And the reason uh, the plume is shaped like this is there's a phenomenon with CO2 that's called density drift. And it's not necessarily strictly with CO2, lots of injectates, anything you inject in the earth could have this phenomenon. But we call it density drift. The, the CO2 plume is lighter than the conate fluid in the reservoir and wants to up dip. And so you can see in this one uh, what that looks like. So this is what a typical cross section of a CO2 plume uh, would look like uh, within um, a computer modeling grid. Uh, the CO2 is light, lighter than the conate fluids, and wants to float to the top of your injection horizon. And so we also have a phenomenon. Uh, we've talked about density drift but we've also need to talk about pore space rights. This is, this is unique in class six. So in this example, this is what a typical oil, class two oil and gas disposal well looks like. So in that world, um, it's pretty simple to go get a permit. You don't need much land for a class two brine disposal permit for the oil and gas business. You need five or 10 acres and this red box represents the five or 10 acres, you get your permit, you go drill your well, you start injecting. Well, if you've been injecting for 30 years, which would be the yellow line, you know that your plume has left the property you own. And 
that is an accepted practice within the class two disposal well world. Everybody in the business knows that your plume has left the land you own. Uh, and that's because it's disposal. So the EPA has taken uh, the tact that we're storing, not disposing. Uh, so this example would be a typical class six environment where you need to control all the pore space. So the 2,500 acres uh, is the red box and you can see the yellow plume and the blue. The blue is the density drift, where my plume has migrated uh, over time. And it always needs to stay within the, la the lands and the core space that you control. And the EPA is going to make you, uh, it's going to be checking on this. So Steve T is going to talk about class six and some of the requirements, but Class six is unique in the fact that every five years, you're gonna to have to go renew your permit. And one of the things that the EPA is gonna be looking for, are you still on the property that you own and control the poor space? All right, let's talk a little bit more about poor space. Um, in most states in the United States, the poor space, belongs to the surface owner, not the mineral owner. Uh, there could be legal reasons why that might have changed. Uh, so you'd need to get your landmen and your lawyers to confirm all this. One thing I'm also gonna talk about right now is oil and gas mineral rights. Um, you're gonna need to take that into consideration. Uh, great example would be is you go get a class six permit to inject your CO2 plume at 6,000 feet. And let's take that scenario where there's an oil and gas field below you at 8,000 feet. Have you created a drilling hazard for the oil and gas mineral owners uh, that they have to drill through your plume now? And are they going to sue you because you've created this drilling hazard. So you need to be cognizant. Uh, you don't need the oil and gas mineral rights, but you need to be cognizant of co-tenant issues with oil and gas companies. Uh, interesting concept. Uh, the Canadians just did away with all this and said, nah, the government owns everything. So uh, makes it very simple. Um, in Canada, uh, one-stop shopping. You don't have to go negotiate with landowners for the poor space in Canada. You just go talk to the government and you get permission from them. So, you know, right now we're currently telling uh, our clients, go find big landowners uh, to where you don't have to deal with a lot of landowners. Um, you know, go find the King Ranch, go find these big timber companies that where you could go do a project solely on one landowner's property, including them owning the mineral rights to where everything you need relative to, to your project, you could get with one signature. Um, I know that's not always possible, uh, but you know, there's, there's a lot of good reason to do that. Um, it's, it's a little unclear in Texas, a little more clear in Louisiana, um, uh, what rights you would have if you can't get your acreage bought put together. An example would be you send your landman out and he can only secure 95% of the pore space in your plume. There's just people that might not want to lease or sell or however you're gonna secure those poor space rights. How are you gonna clean that up? Well, the state of Louisiana already has a mechanism. Uh, they, they're gonna give you eminent domain as long as you've done a good faith effort, let's say 60, 70% of the poor space you got control of. They're gonna give you the rights 
uh, or help you condemn the other poor space that would not participate. Uh, mechanism on how that's going to work in Texas is unknown uh, at this time. Uh, so we're saying go find big landowners. Uh, that might be the driver of why the state of Texas. So uh, if all y'all are following the news, uh, offshore Jefferson County, Texas, in state waters, Texas, uh, the General Land Office of Texas has just let a lease go for all of Jefferson County offshore uh, to Talos. Uh, so that makes it easy. You have one landowner to deal with. Other people that are jumping in that are big landowners are all the big ranches and players like University Lands in Texas that controls vast uh, portions of land and core space. So our, our final topic is regulatory pathways. And the word pathways is kind of a uh, EPA term that they use uh, uh, within uh, the class uh, six world. So, and Steve Petit is going to talk a little bit more about this. He's going to talk a lot about these other classes of disposal wells, and I think it's very important. Uh, a lot of the rules, regulations, language that's in a class six application, for a better term, was cut and paste from other kinds of disposal wells when they created it. Um, so we all know about class two disposal wells. This is the class that's completely reserved for oil and gas operations. So this is brine disposal wells. This is EOR injection wells. This is acid gas disposal wells. Um, so it's really simple in most jurisdictions to go get a brine disposal well. You need a little simplistic geology. You need a wellbore schematic. You need to do an area review to look for these artificial penetrations. In, in most cases, it's only a quarter mile or half a mile uh, around the well you're gonna inject in. And the permit's good forever. So if you get a class two brine disposal well in Texas, New Mexico, Louisiana, it's good forever. You can inject into it for a hundred years as long as you stay within the boundary of the permit. Class six is very, very different. Um, the permit process is uh, as arduous and uh, complicated as any other class of permit. The only class of permit that's close is a class one hazardous waste uh, disposal well. Um, you know, within a class six well, just to give you an example, you have to go drill a core hole, uh, not required in any other class of permit. Uh, so within that core hole, you got to go collect whole core. You got to collect reservoir fluid from the horizon you're going to inject into. And then you have to do detail analysis, including shooting seismic. So you either need to purchase or shoot 2D or 3D seismic um, across your injection uh, project. Uh, you're going to have to have constructing, construction and operating plans. Uh, you're going to have to have an area of view that matches the extent of your plume. Uh, you're going to have to have a testing and monitoring plan. Uh, so the interesting thing about CO2 injection is that when you're done injecting, when you when the, when you end up with the useful life of your project, currently 45Q allows for 12 years. We're telling our clients to go ahead and you know look at modeling out to 20 years because we think there's a tailwind politically to extend the 12 years. Um, but once you're done injecting CO2, class six requires that you stay around and monitor that plume until it geologically stabilizes. It stops moving. Is that 10 years? Is that 20 years? Is that 30 years? Is that 40 years? 
you're going to be renewing your permit even if, when you're done injecting until that till the EPA is convinced that plume is geologically stable. Uh, at that time, they will give you authority to plug your well. And you're also going to have to keep your plugging bond in place for this whole monitoring period after your injection period. Uh, you also have to have an emergency response plan and a uh, remedial response plan, which is unique. The only other place we see that is in a class two acid gas injection well. Um, so there's a lot of unique things, including that this is not a permanent uh, permit. You're gonna have to go renew every five years. Uh, the other unique thing is uh, each permit is for one well. So if your project requires six wells, to get enough CO2 in the ground to meet your commercial needs, you're gonna file six unique permits with the EPA. So this is a rough um, permit timeline. Uh, if you said go today, it would take us, depending on the geology and the jurisdiction, four to six months to um, uh, create the permit application, uh, then it would take the EPA and or the state, if the state actually has primacy and the authority to regulate on behalf of the EPA, 18 to 24 months. Uh, you know, then you gotta go drill your well. And what's unique here is you go drill your well to go collect the core and the reservoir fluid in your injection horizon. Then you have to update your entire class six permit with the EPA, with the actual core data and the fluid data. So that means go tweak all your models. If you learned anything by drilling your injection well, you got to update your model. Um, and at that time, you know, that's going to be another nine to 12 months. And at that time you would get authority to inject. So, uh, Appreciate everybody's time today. I uh, hope this was helpful. Uh, it's a brave new world. Um, you have a regulatory framework that's uh, changing by the day. Um, and so, like I said, there's going to be some legislative changes to help implement uh, class six and class two uh, with MRV. Um, but if you have any questions, uh, my email is up here and my phone number. Glad to uh, uh, field any questions on uh, uh, class six, class two, or um, 45Q. Appreciate your time today. Thank you.